this video we're going to see the basic operating principles of simple flow meters. We're now going to go into the detailed discussion of how compressibility affects these flow meters, how viscous effects would uh, affect these flow meters. We're only going to look at in a way the ideal scenario in which we're looking at flow meters only on the basis of the operating principles that are based in the Bernoulli's equation. And our goal here is to only understand uh, these operating principles. Usually the most effective way to measure, for example, flow rate through a pipe is to place some sort of restrictive element uh, within the pipe. And then what you do is you measure the pressure difference between, for example, if I show you these figures here. So in all of these kinds of pipes or nozzles, what you do is you place this restriction in the middle and then upstream at one, you've got a low velocity, high pressure upstream section here. And then at two, you've got the high velocity. So you've got velocity, which is high here. And uh, you've got pressure, which is lower at subsection two, let's say. And you've got velocity, which is lower here at section one and pressure which is higher at section one. So what you do is that you basically measure the pressure difference in order to find out uh, the flow rate. And there's three different types of configurations that are uh, the most basic types of flow meters. You've got the orifice meter, then you've got the nozzle flow meter, and then you've got the venturi meter. Although the technicalities for each of these meters are different, but the operation is uh, based on the same physical principle. That is that an increase in velocity is going to cause a decrease in pressure. So what we will do is that we will take the Bernoulli's equation and we will apply it for a steady and viscid and incompressible flow between say points one and point two. And now because points one and point two is we assume that the flow is horizontal such that you've got z1 which is going to be equal to z2 so then you can reduce these this equation because this is going to get cancelled out by this one and you're going to be left with and then applying the continuity equation as well we can write the continuity equation as a1 v1 which is equal to a2v2. Now we're here. The only thing is that the area at 2, because you've placed a restriction in there, it's going to be smaller than the area at section 1. And now using both these equations, we can simplify equation, um, both of these equations together, and we can find out because this is equal to flow rate. Right, so we can just plug this equation in here and we can find out the flow rate, which is going to be equal to the area at 2 multiplied by, by this term here. And this term here, basically, we accounted for it from here by finding out the velocity at 2. And now, what this equation shows you is that all you need to do is you need to find out the pressure difference, which is P1 minus P2. And if you can measure that pressure difference, then you will be able to find out the uh, flow rate. And this is your ideal flow rate in a way because the actual flow rate is going to be smaller than this theoretical result, or you can call it the theoretical flow rate. So the theoretical flow rate is always going to be much larger or larger depending on what kind of geometry you're using it's always going to be larger than the actual flow rate so this is the principle to measure the flow rate within pipes now what if you were not looking at pipes and instead you were looking at open channel flow or irrigation canals, for example, that's, that's what we mean by 
open channel that you that you don't have a conduit completely filled up say for example water flowing on um, the riverbed that's um, a natural example of open channel flow so then let's just look at different examples of open channel flows and one of the examples of open channel flows is known as the sluice gate and sluice gates are basically used to regulate and measure the flow rate in open channels so for this sluice gate we can basically look at it from the side and uh, we've got the gate width that is given to us we've got this opening through which the water uh, is flowing uh, through this opening we've got section one and section two here so what we can do is that we can apply the Bernoulli's equation and the continuity equation at uh, points one and two and we can get a good enough approximation for the actual flow rate so we can write down the Bernoulli's equation and what this is going to give us is we can find out for example what the pressures at 1 and 2 are and they're going to be 0 because the gauge pressure is going to be 0 at 1 at the free surface and at 2 as well so this is going to cancel out and other than this we are going to be left with this equation where we've got the velocity profiles at one and two and we assume that these velocity profiles are uniform because this one is upstream really far upstream and this is let's say really far downstream of the gate other than this uh, we can apply the continuity equation which would be q equals a1 v1 equals a2 v2 and we can from here find out what the areas are substitute them here and then we can plug in for example the value of uh, velocity at 2 from here into the equation over here and we can find out the flow rate because of that and that flow rate is going to be equal to q equals this and we can apply a limit in here though because if we've got z1 here if this is a lot larger than z2 then basically we'll be applying this limit onto it where z1 is much much larger than z2 and we can simplify this equation and just write it in terms of q equals z2 into b under root 2g into z1 one important thing to note here is that we used z2 over here instead of using a which is basically the opening of the gate and why did we do that because um, there is a sharp bend here right and because of that the flow is going to be restricted the fluid cannot tur turn a sharp 90 degree angle here and that means a vena contracta is going to be forming here so then because of that we need to account for, for the contraction coefficient we need to account for that using c subscript c and this value is usually less than one for open channel flows or sluice gates and uh, usually though it's around 0 0.61 depending on what the ratio is of a to z2 or a to z1 okay so if you're looking at the ratio of a to z1 if that ratio is between 0 and 0 0.2 then your contraction coefficient is going to be equal to 0 0.61